We're on the air with the School Kids Questionnaire, brought to you by the makers of Alka-Seltzer and one-a-day brand vitamin tablets. And here they are, the Quiz Kids. All right, we're going to play school now, and here are the rules. You listeners send in the questions, and five Quiz Kids answer them. Incidentally, the children never hear or see the questions before the broadcast. We give a Zenith portable radio for every question we use on the show. We may reword them, and if we get similar questions, we're the sole judges. Now, you mail your questions to Quiz Kids Chicago, that's all. Now, the classroom's in charge of our chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Fort Pearson, and good evening, everybody. Well, Quiz Kids, at the end of our school session tonight, we will hear from a special guest listener in New York who will talk to us by special wire. She is a woman whose name will go down in history with such names as Florence Nightingale and Madame Curie. She's the Australian nurse whose work has meant new hope for victims of infantile paralysis all over the world, Sister Elizabeth Kenny. And now, just like in regular school, we start out with roll call. Harvey? I'm Harvey Bennett Fishman. I'm 12 years old, and I'm in 7A at the Bradwell School in Chicago. Gerard? I'm Gerard Darrell. I'm 10 years old, and I'm in 6A at Bradwell School in Chicago. Margaret? I'm Margaret Mary. I'm 14 years old. I live in Western Springs, and I'm a sophomore at Lyons Township High School. And our kindergarten department, Joel? I am Joel Kupperman. I am 6 years old and 2B at Fulton School. And a new quiz kid who's currently playing in that famous stage hit, The Watch on the Rhine, Smila. I'm Smila Brin. I'm 14 years old, and I'm in second year high school in professional children's school in New York. Uh, Smila, where have you attended school before you went on the stage? I went to kindergarten in Vienna, and then we went to Paris, and I went to school there for four years. And after that, we went back to Vienna several times and to visit grandmother and... Uh, once it was five days before Hitler came over, and that was the last time I saw her. Well, Smila, we're certainly glad you're with us tonight instead of your old schoolroom in Vienna or Paris. Our first question is a race against time. You pick a subject, and you have just 30 seconds to talk about it. You'll get five points for every fact you can squeeze into 30 seconds. Ready for it? Okay, Joe. My subject is Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer can be a great comfort when you have a cold. Alka-Seltzer helps ease up the headache and that ache all over feeling a cold brain. Now, if your cold makes your throat feel raw and raspy, try this soothing gargle. An Alka-Seltzer tablet dissolved in a quarter glass of warm water. Alka-Seltzer can be most helpful, too, when you're bothered with a little stomach upset, simple neuralgia, or sore, aching muscles. Alka-Seltzer is sold at all druggists in two sizes. 30 cents and... That, that's all for it. That's all. Time's out. <laughs> Let's see. Now, you, uh, you brought out 13 points, which gives you a high score of 65 points. Well, that was all right for it. Nice going. And now then, our next question is all for the quiz kids. Your first question tonight comes from Arthur A. Gladstone of Arlington, Virginia. Would you be pleased or displeased if Varicella paid you a visit? Margaret? Well, I wouldn't be pleased because it's some kind of a disease. You say oh. you wouldn't be pleased. I wouldn't be pleased. You wouldn't. Well, that's, that's all right. Uh, let's see if we can find out just what that uh, stands for, what it means. What uh, disease? Smila? Chicken pox. Chicken pox is right. That a girl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Joel, I, I thought you might have some definite opinions about that. Uh, I understood you uh, had a little experience with chicken pox lately. Uh, but, I, but I never heard of the other name. You never heard of the other name? <laughs> well, okay, now here's our next question. I beg pardon, Joel? Now, they usually call it chicken pox, not, not the other name. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the best to say chicken pox. Then you, you really know what you've got. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Ida Glenn of San Francisco, California, submits this current events question. Why were each of these men in the news of the last year? The only joker in this question is that Mrs. Glenn makes it really hard by giving you first names only. Now, here's the first one. Fulgencio. Margaret. That's Fulgen or Fulgencio Batista, the president of Cuba, who visited the United States and President Roosevelt recently. That's right. All right, now here is the next name. 
Jawaharlal. Harvey? Well, that is the uh, first name of... Well, his real name is Nehru, his last name, and he is the uh, second leader in India next to Gandhi. Very good, Harvey. Very good. And here's the next name. Chester. Smila? Nimitz. He's the uh, ambassador. No. That's as far as I know. No, you uh, you gave me the right last name. Uh, Joe? Uh, I think he's, he's the leader of the ships in the, of the fleet in the Pacific. <laughs> good. Very good, Joe. Yes, sir. Joel, your 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 finger is working all right tonight. <laughs> Admiral Chester William Nimitz, Commander in Chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. <laughs> I'm getting to talk like Joel here. <laughs> well, it sounds cute anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> Two out of three on this one. Since we are now fighting a global war, Mr. A. F. Humphreys, Washington D.C. thinks you children should have a comprehensive idea of the world as a whole. Compared with North and South America, how far north or south is each of these cities? In other words, what points in the Western Hemisphere have approximately the same latitude as these cities in the Eastern Hemisphere? The first is Rome. What large city in this hemisphere has approximately the same latitude as Rome? Joel? Chicago. Chicago. That is very good. And uh, now the next is uh, Port Darwin, Australia. Port Darwin, Australia. Margaret? Well, I'll take a, co- a town named uh, Punta Arenas, or Arenas, in uh, Argentina. No, I, I, I can't accept that. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was uh, thinking of uh, Lima, Peru. All right, we still have one more chance here. How about Stalingrad? Joel? At the northern boundary line between the United States and Canada, above the state of Washington on the map. That's just right, Joel, my boy. <laughs> just right. <laughs> Joel, you're going to have to get the chicken pox again sometime. <laughs> All right. By the way, I, I received a novel wire this week from Columbia Pictures Corporation in Hollywood. They've been looking for a cute little two-year-old girl smart enough to handle dialogue. They want her for their next Blondie picture, Blondie Buys a Horse. I guess they figured we had a corner on the bright youngsters department. Of course, two years old is a little young even for quiz kids, but that didn't stop us. We just sent them pictures of Margaret Merrick's little sister, Susie. Margaret, think Susie would be all right? Well, I I suppose so, but uh, if I know that little youngster... I think she'll make her own dialogue. She will. Huh? <laughs> I'll bet you would, too. Well, uh, maybe some of our listeners know of a cute little two-year-old girl who can speak line. Well, we better get back to the radio business. All of us know the old counting out rhyme, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. but James N. Rasmussen of Tacoma, Washington, thinks other rhymes are now used on schoolyards to count players out of games. Do you know any others that are used to see who gets first turn? Well, we'll start out with Harvey. Well, this isn't exactly a rhyme, but we always do odds and evens, and that is we, we throw our fingers out, then we count around, and uh, the one who has the last number usually drops out or is picked to do something. Uh-huh. Well, that's all right, Harvey. It doesn't exactly have to rhyme. Uh, Margaret? Well, uh, we hold out our fists. At least I used to. Uh, say one potato, two potato, and on the seventh one, you put one fist behind you, and you go around until one person is out. Well, that's, that's, that's a good way, too, yeah. Uh, Smila? Well, that rhymes. It's one potato, two potato, three potato, or four potato, five potato, six potato, more. Well, good for you, Smila. <laughs> Joel? Uh, and there's one uh, that, that's called one, two, three, four, Mary at the college store, five, six, seven, eight, eating cookies off the plate. <laughs> and, there's, and there's another one that's one, two, three, four, five. I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I let him go again. And there's still another uh, <laughs> that, that eeny, meeny, miny, no. Well, well, look, uh, uh, Joel, uh, we've, uh, let, uh, wait just a minute. You can't use that. Trouble starts when nations grow. <laughs> 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All good children go to heaven. Uh-huh. You say that, and the person that's on heaven is up. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. That's very, very good. That that was a lot of fun. That sort of takes me back through the years. <laughs> oh, dear. I can't tell you how many. Well, all right. Next question. Now, Miss Elizabeth Pignatelli of Providence, Rhode Island, wants you to count legs a while. How many legs has a laughing jackass? Margaret? Um, I think it's two or three. Rather four. It's a hyena. Uh, well, let's see what Gerard has to say. Oh, well, the laughing jackass is a bird from Australia, and that has two. That is right. That's right. Uh huh. All right. Uh, how about a spider? Harvey. I think he has about eight. Eight legs. Uh, what were you going to say, Margaret? That's what I was going to say. Well, eight is correct. Uh huh. All right. How about a centipede, Margaret? Well, he has anywhere from 26 to 109 legs. And uh, he doesn't always have to have 100. No, that, that is right. Uh, however, let's see if we can uh, uh, get some more on this. Gerard? Well, I have a specimen at home called a millipede, and that has 19 legs. 19 legs, uh-huh. Harvey? Well, uh, I had one that somebody sent me. Uh, I think it had uh, uh, 39 or 40 Yes, it have 40, and, uh, well, 20 on each side. Mm-hmm. Well, you kids were all right. Uh, there's two sources on authority. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, from 30 to 170 legs, and the other uh, from 38 to 400 legs. Well, kids, uh, uh, that's just about all the time of the questions right now. Uh, friends with a shortage of doctors in many communities due to the war... And with the possible scarcity of certain foods, here are some questions that every mother should be prepared to answer. What can I do to safeguard the health of my family? What facts should I study about food to make sure my family is getting a healthful, nourishing diet in spite of possible food shortages? Well, Mrs. America, vitamins are going to play an important part in answering those questions. And here's one suggestion that we would like to make. Why don't you supplement your meals with one-a-day brand vitamin tablets? The Miles Laboratories make two kinds of one-a-day tablets, one to supply the A and D, or as they are also called, the cod liver oil vitamins, and the other to give you those very important vitamins of the B-complex. Just think, one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets contain the same A and D vitamins that you get in butter, cream, milk, cheese, and the fish liver oil. Yet there is absolutely no fishy, oily taste to them, and no aftertaste. And just a single tablet contains a normal day's supply of these A and D vitamins. So even if those foods aren't as plentiful as they used to be, you're still guaranteeing your children that safeguarding supply of A and D vitamins. And not only that, Fort, but you're doing it at a cost of just one and a fifth pennies a day. Let's not limit this to children, Charlie. Grown-ups as well as children need those A and D vitamins especially with the cold season in full swing. We should all do everything we can to build up resistance. So ask your druggist today for one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets made by Mile. And, Mr. Kelly, the quiz kids wait with bated breath for the next question. All right, Fort. This literature question is from Mr. Jerry M. Holmes of New Orleans, Louisiana. What literary character would you be if you found yourself face-to-face with these distressing situations? You are facing a wild bison who has a beautiful girl tied to his horn. Mila? Well, that's, I think, in Cool Water, the uh, monster, I mean, the uh, giant, the Legion giant that, uh, I know the princess on it, her name was Legia, and uh, Ursus, maybe. Ursus, that's right. Good for you, Mila. All right? Now, listen. You are facing what appears to be a large army, but when you attack, the soldiers turn out to be peaceful sheep. What literary character would you be? You are facing what appears to be a large army, but when you attack, the soldiers turn out to be peaceful sheep. Well, that would be Don Quixote. 
from The Adventures of Don Quixote by Cervantes. Now, here's the next one. You don't care especially for children, and now, unexpectedly, six of them are dependent on you. Harvey? Well, that's in the Pied Piper, and, uh, well, in the screen version, Marty Woolley is uh, burdened with six children whom he has to take back to uh, England to safety. That's right. Harvey, can you give us the Pied Piper's name? Uh, oh, gee. Uh, I think it's Mr., uh... Oh, <laughs> Uh, no, I don't remember. I don't know what's wrong with Joel tonight. Every time he raises his hand, he squeaks. <laughs> well, I'll wait just a minute. We want to give Harvey a chance on this. Well, I don't believe I remember it. Well, that's uh, really beside the point, Harvey. I thought uh, maybe we could get his name. Let's see. Joel has his hand up. Huh? Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard, that's right. John Howard. <laughs> I guess it was as cold in Ithaca, New York, last week as it was here in Chicago because Chester L. Marks, who lives there, wants you to sing out some song titles that might have warmed us up a little. Can you think of any titles that might alleviate winter weather? All right, Margaret? There's one that goes, um, I don't want to set the world on fire. Mm-hmm. And it's been so long ago that I think I can do it, but I'm not sure. Well, just the title uh, is all you have to give us. I don't want to... No. <laughs> well, I've forgotten that, but um, maybe somebody else could sing it, but there's one that... Keep the home fires burning. Keep the home fires burning? And, uh... I think it's... I don't want to set the world on fire. That's it. That's right, Margaret. <laughs> All right, let's have some more, kid. Gerard? Well, there's... Uh, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we mustn't forget that one. <laughs> Mila? Is that the hot foot flu or... <laughs> Oh, I got my titles mixed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Harvey? Well, uh, I I think she means five foot flu with a four yeah. foot. <laughs> I think so, too, Harvey. Uh, uh, did you have one for us, Harvey? Well, I was thinking of uh, two of the ones that already have been named. Oh, I see. Joel, uh, did you have a song in mind, a song title? Yeah, I, but it was said. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I'll tell you, there's nothing like protecting oneself, is there? <laughs> well, I think we'd better move along here. Uh, Pauline Salzman of Grand Rapids, Michigan, wants us to imagine that these two military men of the past are broadcasting messages home to their wives. Now, listen carefully to the first one, and you're to tell us who he is. Hello, Mary. How are you and the seven kids? As you've probably heard by now, we didn't do so badly at Manassas. We gave that man Pope a run for his money. Harvey? Well, that would be General Robert E. Lee. Uh, his wife was uh, Mary Park Custis, and he did have seven children. And uh, the Battle of Manassas, I believe, was better known as Bull Run, Manassas Junction. Good for you, Harvey. All right, now, kids, listen mm. carefully to this next one. Hello, Joe. Comment vas-tu, Egypte? Et tu vas très bien. Pay my compliments to Hortas et Eugène. Mila? Well, that was Napoleon to Josephine, and Hortense was her daughter, and I didn't hear... Well, Robert. what, uh, that's right, but, uh, Smila, what was he saying? Um, hello, Josephine, I think he was give my regards to Hortense, and I'm from, uh, speaking from Egypt, and I don't remember what he said. Well, that's, that's, that's very, very close, Smila, very close. All right, now, uh... Who might this be broadcasting a message to his people? Deutsche Volksgenossen, die Lage in Russland ist schrecklich. Die Lage in Afrika ist schrecklich. Die Lage ist schrecklich überall. Ah, 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 ah. All right, Smila? Well, it's Hitler, but I doubt whether he'd say that to his people. He says the situation in Russia is terrible. The situation is terrible all over. I don't think he'd say that. They cover up pretty well. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, kids. Uh, Franklin Shaw of Battle Creek, Michigan, wants uh, you to put on your thinking caps, not your nightcaps, <laughs> and think of three kinds of beds that you wouldn't ordinarily sleep in. Three kinds of beds. Gerard? Well, there's uh, a trundle bed, and most kids... Nowadays, don't sleep in that. That was That's very right, old-fashioned. Right. And then uh, the Eskimos 
I usually, uh, they have uh, beds on blocks of ice, and then the the natives in uh, Africa, they usually sleep, sleep on straw uh-huh. or grass. Very good. Gerard, Margaret? Well, there's a, um, a bed that an old giant had in which he put all the travelers that uh, stopped by his wayside, I mean by his wayside inn, and uh, if they were too short for the bed, he stretched them on a rack. And if they were too long, he lopped off their heads or their feet. And I wouldn't want to sleep on that one. Oh, no, no. no. I like to live. <laughs> that bed is definitely out. Uh, Harvey? Well, it's a bed of roses. Well, you might want to sleep in a bed of roses. <laughs> uh, 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 there's uh, these beds that these Egyptian uh, men sleep on. They're full of nails. And uh, also uh, a bed of hornets. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, uh, Harvey. Thank you. Joel? Uh, well, a big boy won't put on a sleep in a cradle. No. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly wouldn't. <laughs> and now we'll let you catch your breath a minute before this next question, quiz kids. Uh, Fort Pearson, would you like to continue your vitamin lesson? Yes, thank you, Joe. We covered the A and D vitamins the last time, so now I'd like to mention the B vitamins, the ones you get in one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablets. These B vitamins are found in meats, whole grains, various fruits and vegetables. They're extremely important where energy, digestion, and nerves are concerned. So if you're feeling sort of all tired out and nervous, it could be you're not getting enough of those B vitamins. And just so you won't have to bother with them three or four times each busy day, the Miles Laboratories developed this single one-a-day brand B-complex tablet to give you the full minimum daily supply of all the B vitamins for which requirements have been established. Yes, all in one little pleasant tasting tablet. And what's more, they're pleasantly low price too. A whole month's supply for just 90 cents. Now that's a name to remember when you're buying vitamins. One-a-day brand vitamin B-complex tablet. One-a-day is the registered trademark of the Miles Laboratories who also make Alka-Seltzer. Now, on with the brain battle, teacher. All right, Fort. Mrs. L.M. Friel of Rochester, New York, sends this question. She wants you to tell how the following military men fooled the enemy through subterfuges. What subterfuge did Richard the Lionhearted use against the Saracens at the Citadel of Acer? Can you answer that one? Well, let's go on to the next one. What subterfuge did Ulysses avoid by stuffing his men's ears with wax and tying them to the ship's mast? Uh, The men, not the ears. (laughs) Mila? Well, the uh, siren, they were going between uh, uh, um, Cirrus and uh, Charybdis. Charybdis and... uh, well, the siren would bewitch the men, and so he wear, stuffed their ears with wax so they wouldn't hear it and wouldn't stay there. And uh, Charybdis was a whirlpool, and they were going through that, so I guess that's why he tied them. They wouldn't want to be um, taken in the water. Well, that's all right, Smila. Now let's see if we can get some more, uh, Margaret. Well, the sirens uh, had, I guess, must have had beautiful voices because nobody... Uh, could withstand uh, their power. It must have been something like a lodestone or a magnet. And so he stuffed their ears with wax so they couldn't hear him. That's right. And uh, uh, I think he tied them to the mast because they might have uh, uh, hurt a little anyway. But he tied, him, he tied himself to the mast, too, I know, because somebody had to steer the ship and then he couldn't. That's he right. Couldn't <laughs> All right, thank you. Now, on this next one, how did General Zukov fool the Germans not so long ago when his heavy artillery crossed the river near Rezeth on an invisible bridge? Uh, Margaret? Well, he had his men build a bridge backward underneath the river, starting from the German banks, but it was higher, so the tanks could go over and get the Germans. That is absolutely right. Good for you. (laughs) Well, that's all there is. There is no more, kids, except those report cards, which let us know which three of the five children win a chance to come back next week. Uh, uh, Joe, how about those important rewards? Oh, yes. Quiz kids, there's a $100 war bond for each of you, winners and losers alike, from the makers of Alka-Seltzer. You know, Joe, with a little girl like Smila on the program tonight, It brings home to us the real purpose of those war bonds. The reason why every father and mother should buy them. For every youngster like Smila who escaped the Nazi bullets and starvation, there are thousands who didn't escape. So that it may never happen to our children, buy war bonds. 
Oh, I see you have the report cards, Joel. Yes, they're ready for it, and here's what they say. Quiz kids, as a class tonight, you missed one question, and Smila was first, Margaret second, and Harvey third. And Smila, it's a shame about you. Here you are, one of the winners who should come back next week, but you can't because your show is moving out of town. To, uh, that, that gives a break to the next one in line, uh, who is Joel. Also in class, with uh, you winners next week, we'll have Richard Porter, age 9, of Chicago, and Claude Brenner, age 14, of Lake Forest. And say, folks, those youngsters next week are going to need a lot of good questions, so send them in, won't you, please? Remember, we give a dandy Zenith portable radio for each question we use. That's the Zenith model, model with the famous wave magnet, and it's a real prize these days, believe me. Just mail your questions to Quiz Kids, Chicago. All right, and now then, we turn things over to Margaret Merrick. All right, Margaret. Well, I'm supposed to introduce Sister Kenny. And uh, it's, uh, her name has been very saintly to me for so long, I never thought I'd have an honor like this. Well, her story goes this way. 32 years ago, Sister Kenny was a bush, bush nurse in the wild country of Australia. And she was 100 miles from the nearest doctor or the hospital. An epidemic of infantile paralysis broke out, and she didn't know how doctors treated this disease, so she just did the best she could. And she discovered a treatment which gives normal life back to 80% of the victims. And before her treatment, only 17% recovered. I met Sister Kenny last Friday. I'm sorry I didn't meet her a year and a half ago when infantile left me with a crippled leg. So you see why I speak her name with reverence. Elizabeth Kenny. I'm sorry, Margaret. My treatment was not available in Chicago the morning you woke to find both your legs paralyzed. It still isn't available in many parts of the country. But thanks in a large measure to the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, the March of Dimes, 40 states now have special clinics. It takes time, Margaret, and money. I've been in this country less than three years. If the Kenny treatment were limited to the patients I could treat with my own hands, I could do little. The United States has many, many cases of infantile paralysis. We must train many doctors and nurses so that they can carry on this work in their own com communities. We're making progress, Margaret. We still have a long way to go. We'll get there, mile by mile, dime by dime as people give those miles of dimes in this campaign which ends next Saturday with President Roosevelt's birthday. This fund trains nurses and doctors in the Kenny treatment. It pays for research to find the cause of the disease, and then we hope a preventative or infallible cure. Most important, it assures every victim of infantile paralysis, regardless of race, creed, or financial circumstances, the very best of care. Surely everyone listening in can spare a dime or a dollar to save the children from the curse of twisted, shrunken limbs. Please send your contributions to agencies in your own communities or directly to the president in the White House. And remember, you may be helping yourself because next year, some eight to 10,000 of you will have infantile paralysis. And Margaret, don't give up hope about improving that leg of yours. I'll be back in Chicago soon, and we'll talk it over. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenny. It was a great honor to have you speak on our program. And now, this is Joe Kelly dismissing the quiz kids until next Sunday at this same time. Good night, kids. Good, Good night, night, Mr. Mr. Kelly. Kelly. Listen to the Quiz Kids every Sunday at the same time. And on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, listen to your old friends, Lum and Abner, on most of these same stations. This is Fort Pearson speaking. This program came to you from Chicago. This is the Blue Network. W-E-N-R Chicago, 9...